and this kind of moves into the next pillar of recovery, you know, nutrition obviously is a massive part of recovery. And I'm almost going to put this in recovery as well too, is, is strength training. Strength training, I believe is essential for everyone, but specifically endurance athletes. Just did a podcast with uh, Sal Stefano from Mind Pump, and he he talks about the the revolution of resistance training, and what happens when you're just doing cardiovascular training, typically spent on like a treadmill or a stairmaster, very low intensity, low impact, is it is catabolic, and naturally, what's going to happen over time is your metabolism is going to slow down through just doing cardiovascular training. And what do we see with strength training or resistance training is that it increases and improves the metabolism because you are building muscle and muscle requires more calories. It burns more calories. Strength training is great, not just for recovery, but for for strength and performance and endurance athletes. One, for a healthy metabolism. Two, to mitigate risk of injury. Right, And we see overuse injuries in endurance athletes all the time. If you can maintain strength in your glutes, your hips, your quads, hamstrings, calves, entire lower body, your core, you will mitigate risk of injury throughout a prep. And what I've seen is that is one of the biggest missing pieces in endurance athletes programs. I completely agree. Um, You know, in the 1980s and 1990s, I don't think it was stressed at all with distance runners. Um, I came up in that space. I matured as an athlete, even at the collegiate level, in a space where we didn't take it as seriously as we should. Sometimes we didn't do it at all. We now know that strength programming should be part of everybody's routine. Now, uh, there's different ways to do it. Um, there are some basic parameters within which you need to operate to do your strength training, but it needs to be a component of what you do. Um, injury, um, mitigation is really, really huge. Uh, When you're hurt, you're not in the game. When you're not in the game, you're not getting better. And I think, uh, uh, we've come a long way in the last 20 years where we understand that, Hey, good glute strength could then prevent you from having a anterior hip flexor problem, right? Having good core strength and having good uh, 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 stabilizers in our upper body can uh, help us prevent from having a biomechanical inefficiency that makes us offload too much of our weight onto our forefoot, which can then cause an Achilles tendon problem. When you don't really have a frank Achilles tendon injury as much as you do a pain that's a symptom of being really, really weak through your core, so to speak, right? Those are just examples of, I think, what doing strength work can do um, to help keep you in the game. Yeah, I mean, recovery is just like nutrition in terms of it's one of those things, especially in a big block, because if you're really going after it for this marathon, your mileage is going to get to 60, 70, 80 miles a week. I mean, we're going to get mileage up to... 70, 75 miles a week. I got a couple of guys running 100 miles a week. And that's when proper nutrition and recovery techniques are the most important. Because what it does is you're being proactive rather than reactive. Mm -hmm. What happens when everyone gets injured? They throw the kitchen sink at it. It's completely reactive. Why isn't this getting better? Well, you're trying to address a problem that's already there. Recovery techniques that are implemented from the beginning is a proactive approach where you are reducing risk of that injury even starting from the beginning. Like some of my favorite things to do, I I personally do love static stretching, even though we just talked to Dr. Bauer at Run Lab this past week and, you know, dynamic stretching is superior over static stretching. And we found that out in the last 20 years. Yeah, and dynamic is, should be your priority. Uh, I personally love myofascial release in terms of foam rollers, using lacrosse balls to break up tissue that's tight, going to get sports massages, deep tissue massages. Um, you know, especially like we talked about this this past weekend, a lot of runners, myself included, will occasionally get knee issues. 
what happens when you get a knee issue? You think that that is the point of the issue. So you try to address the knee. And what you find is, well, maybe the knee issue is because of a tight hip flexor. Mm -hmm. And maybe your tight hip flexor is because of a weak glute. That's right. So you're trying to identify, you know, these issues of, of what's going on and why it's happening. But if we can get ahead of the injuries with some of these myofascial release, dynamic stretching, strength training, I love using the sauna, compression boots, like the Normatec compression boots. Mm -hmm. um, I'll use toe spacers at night to kind of just relieve some of the bones of the feet. There's a lot of these things that we can do and implement into our routine and it shouldn't take up your entire life. Right, but there's things you can do in the morning, your free time. If you're watching TV, throw some compression boots on, do some stretches. Correct. Add the add the toe spacers. Get enough sleep. I mean, sleep it's it's a number one tool for recovery. Just add these things into your your prep from the beginning to reduce risk of something happening. Right, and you know, <clears throat> you know, uh, uh, you could get as specific as hiring a, a you know a a strength coach or working with a strength coach who works almost exclusively in the, um, in the distance running space and can um, address the specific mo not just, not just strength, but also mobility uh, um, exercises that are absolutely vital to addressing the classic weaknesses in distance runners. Um, I work closely with a coach right now who uh, um, um, is working with a ton of my, um, my athletes right now, and, and she just does a fantastic job. I mean, Mallory does a great job, but have a strength program, have a recovery routine, have something that has been at least vetted or peer reviewed by somebody who's in the know enough to be able to say, okay, this is, this is better than nothing. And I think that's the key is listen, just do something that's better than nothing. It doesn't have to be just so exacting and just absolutely perfect and just rapturous, you know, where you got, you know, rainbows blowing out of your ass every day. Just get something that's solid, something that's good, something that works for you and fits into your life. And like you said, it might be some, a routine that you can run through and do some circuits uh, three days a week and it takes 20 minutes. Listen, if you spend 60 minutes a week on strength, better than zero, right? Yeah, you're right. Here we go. I mean, what, what happens with the running is if you have anything that is inefficient or hurt or injured, endurance sports is that one thing that is going to expose it a hundred times. Well, let's tell the real life story about what we discovered with Dr. Uh, uh, with Kim Davis and Dr. Bauer. We weren't super, super concerned about it, but you were having a little tiny bit of discomfort just uh, outside of your kneecap. And we were kind of exploring the why on that. And of course you had just come across a 100, you know, mile race that you decided to do, you know, uh, if you had been running 15 miles a week, I don't think that even if you were in exactly the same strength space and had the same issues that that knee would have ever started hurting. But you ran a hundred mile race and it exposed something that we sort of discovered and we kind of had an aha moment there when we were in the lab together just last weekend, right? Mm -hmm. And what was it? It was a tight TFL, which is very interesting to me because anytime someone assumes that they have a tight hip or hip flexor, they think it's a psoas muscle. The psoas muscle is a very buzzy word right now, right? And yeah. I thought it was my psoas muscle as Dr. Bauer is kind of working me over. He's like, Oh, it's your TFL. I never heard of my TFL, you know, before. And I didn't know what it was. They had to show us the chart on the wall. They did. Yeah. And it's kind of like right outside of that hip bone, but it goes down to the knee kind of alongside the IT band. And it was kind of tugging on my knee, which was causing the knee issues, which just goes back to say is just because you have a concern in one mm -hmm. part, doesn't mean that's where the issue is stemming from, but we would have never have identified that tight TFL if I wanted to have spent 19 hours and 13 minutes running on it. No, no, I would have never discovered it. And then, you know, it was causing some tugging. So then it tugged on the IT band. The IT band attaches, uh, uh, goes down the side of your leg, attaches outside of the knee. And it was symptomatic at the knee. You didn't have a knee injury at all. 
You did not have any injury. Your IT band was so tight, it was causing pain because the TFL was tugging on it up at your hip. And then we later started looking at this and says, hey, you would come off of a little, uh, some of the strength training stuff that you had done to try to freshen your legs up in the four weeks prior to Rocky Raccoon. And so then even though everything is in the realm of strong with you, there was a slight imbalance between your anterior, which is your front, and your posterior, which is your back, in your glutes and the and the and the and the solution actually is just let's get back doing stuff that activates your glutes. It's gonna offload your TFL, it's gonna stop pulling on IT band, this thing gonna make your knee stop hurting. So at the end of the day, basically it was it was your butt that oh. was slightly out of balance strength wise with your front that caused a little pain on the outside of your kneecap. Who'd have thunk it? Right? At, at a weak ass. Yeah. Yeah, nobody's ever called you a weak ass before. No, but uh, currently my, <laughs> my, my glutes are a little weaker than apparently they should be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the cool thing is, is what you realize is having a global strength routine to kind of try to keep everything in balance and stay strong. Um, it's all about injury prevention as much as um, um, anything else. The thing is, at the end of the day, it's going to happen. Like some injuries you can't avoid. I'd be curious how many injury or how many athletes of yours currently like percentage wise have some sort of small nagging injury. Mm, some, but not very many. It's impressive because most of them have some sort of strength routine. And because I'm really, really careful with the way I craft the workouts where I am conscious of three things that we have to watch in our training, which is training volume, training intensity and training density. And I control those things uh, meticulously. I wring my hands over a half mile here, a half mile there when I am structuring the workouts, probably neurotically, but that's my job is to be neurotic, to coach my ass off, to make sure that I keep everybody in the game in injury free. And then when you add in uh, most people who have some sort of strength program, those are the things that keep us out of trouble. Staying strong, monitoring your volume, your density, and your intensity. We can go into what those three things mean. And when you monitor those things carefully and you know what you're doing, you can really, really keep an athlete in the game, which then means they have a chance to get better. I mean, when I heard you talk about uh, volume, intensity, and density a few weeks ago, that really clicked for me. And I explained that actually in this, this past video we filmed, where if I think about, you know, this past track workout we just did, there is a specified volume for that workout. There's a total amount of mileage or meters we were going to cover. Right. There was a certain intensity or pace for each one that I was going to cover. And then density, there was a certain amount of rest that I was going to have in between each interval. That can be applied to a specific training session or an entire training block. Right. So <clears throat> what I find that befalls many runners is that they get into this obsession with having an overly dense training program, meaning they run too many hard workouts too close together. Um, it is a product of the United States scholastic and university systems where we're married to this two workout a week um, uh, 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 program it really is just incredibly arbitrary. Um, why do we have to be doing two hard workouts a week? It's a function of the fact that we have two four-year uh, timeframes that we are really obsessed with in this country for some very utilitarian reasons. We're in high school for four years. We have four years to go and get that vaunted college scholarship. We have four years in the university system in order uh, to meet all of our goals as collegiate athletes. And so what we do is, is we proceed with this immense amount of urgency that makes us train in ways that are physiologically bankrupt and that are not necessarily the most um, productive when it comes to keeping us in the game and actually helping us improve. And so what happens is, is when we reduce training density, in other words, it's not as dense the amount of hard running we do. We spread it out. And what I've found for a lot of people who are working people who are not pixies laying around on massage tables and sitting in cryogenic chambers and all this other stuff, um, I find that one workout a week is really, really good 
because then we have time to recover in between them. So reducing training density can help prevent injury because we're not ripping and tearing at our fascia and our connective tissue and uh, doing the things that tend to get us hurt, right? Training volume. Well, we're all pretty familiar with what that means, which is how much are you doing? And we do it on the micro scale, and we also do it on the macro scale when we go into the analysis. How much are you running in a week or in a month? How many miles a week you run? We hear that a lot, right? But then it's the volume within the workout, right? It has to be appropriate enough for you to meet the physiologic demands of the race you're trying to run. But it also can't be too much because then you run the risk of basically overcooking that turkey, right? So we got to be smart. And so control your volume so you don't get injured. Control your density so that you don't get injured. Control your intensity so that, one, you don't shut down your aerobic pathways to where you um, basically eviscerate any chance you have of getting aerobic adaptations. But also controlling the intensity means you're not just ripping and tearing at your muscle fibers, right? And flooding your legs with lactate that takes two days, three days to get out of your system where you're limping around on sore legs. Control your intensity. Make it appropriate. Control your density. Make it appropriate. Control your volume. Make it appropriate. You're going to progress. You're probably not going to get hurt. I think my new thing I'm going to say during this marathon prep, you said it earlier, I'm just going to refer to my, my, my fast runs as ripping ass. You should rip an ass. <laughs> you know what? If people don't get anything else out of this podcast, they got to get ripping ass, man. I'm going to have a rod design a shirt. It's just all about ripping ass. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, uh, we, we love hammerheads and, um, I was joking around with a couple of my athletes the other day and I says, you know, it is with great fear that I'm pairing you two ladies together on this workout because you are both hammerheads and uh, they're pretty self-deprecating about it. They, uh, um, <clears throat> they have trouble with the intensity part, but that's what you get with type A athletes. I mean, we're talking about, you know, women who are 240 something uh, uh, marathoners and uh, uh, trying to control the intensity. And um, I always tell people sometimes as your coach, I'm as much your brake pedal as I am your gas pedal. Because a lot of people think coach is just there to motivate. Or a lot of times we're actually there to try to de-escalate. We're there trying to hold on to the reins. And I swear to goodness, some of these athletes are like riding a buck and bronco with a rodeo. I mean, I literally feel like sometimes after these practices, I need a neck brace. Because man, uh, when you get driven people who are out there and they are getting after it, you just got to say, hey, Okay, calm down, calm it down, calm it down, calm it down, you know? Um, oh, I mean, that, smoke coming off your shoes there. That's my issue, or was my issue last year when I started running these track workouts, and Josh did a really good job pulling That's the- your brake pedal. Yeah, he was he was pulling my reins really well. Yeah. And, because yeah. uh, you remember the track workouts, I would go out first, and I would try to lead uh, that group in the front, and it, it's just, it is a type A, it's get out in front and hold it. Well, think about it. That's what your career- Right now, in everything that you're doing, you, you're out front. You're leading. Yeah. Right? Um, it's go, 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 go. It's be the best. Um, and that's a good thing. I would, I would rather try to coach aggressiveness, and I would rather coach uh, 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 the hammerhead out of somebody did try to coach toughness and aggressiveness into somebody, mm -hmm. right? I'd much rather it be that way. Hey guys, thanks for checking out the video. And if you enjoyed it, please like the video and subscribe so you don't miss out on any future releases. And if you wanna watch the full episode, go right here and click on the video to my left.